Warm welcome to all our members and friends of uh, the former members of Congress uh, in uh, Washington DC and of course Atlantic Brook in Berlin. Uh, we are hosting this event in cooperation and I'm most delighted uh, that this uh, came together on, on short notice. Uh, thank you so much to the team and the leadership uh, uh, the uh, former members of Congress. It's a great honor to have you all. Um, the title of today's event is The Current State of Transatlantic Relations, and I'm sure there is a lot to talk about. Of course, in uh, recent days, uh, our minds were occupied with the current debate on the potential withdrawal of U.S. troops from uh, Germany, but I'm certainly, uh, we certainly also address other topics. Without any further ado, I would like to hand over to our moderator, Elisabeth von Hammerstein, she is program director at the International Affairs uh, Department of Kerber Foundation, certainly one of the most renowned institutions in the field of foreign policy in Germany. And uh, yeah, uh, of course, she's also a young leader alumna uh, of Atlantic Book, it has to be mentioned here. And with that, I would like to hand over to you, Elizabeth. Thank you so much for steering us uh, through today's discussion. Thank you so much. And I will Thank you so you. much. Thank you so much, David. And uh, dear friends and colleagues from Germany and from Europe and from across the big pond, on behalf of the former members of Congress Congressional Study Group in Germany and on behalf of Atlantic Brücke, I would also like to welcome all of you and uh, thank you for joining us uh, for a conversation that will connect Europe and North America once again. And it's a pleasure for me to moderate this discussion. Before I introduce uh, our four distinguished speakers, just one brief technical remark on how to participate. If you want to ask a question, please just use the Q&A function and I will include your question in the discussion later on. And this is an on the record discussion. The video uh, will be made available afterwards as I was told and that's all as in as for the technical remarks. Now over to our four distinguished speaker. It's a great honor to welcome Congressman Brendan Boyle and members of German Parliament Peter Bayer and Alexander Kulitz and former Congressman Charles Dent. Let me start with you, Congressman Boyle. I will just say a few introductory remarks and then uh, turn it over to you. Brennan Boyle was born and raised in the city of Philadelphia. He attended the University of Notre Dame and later graduated from Harvard University's John F. Kennedy School of Government with a master's in public policy. And when I read your bio, I noticed that there are two firsts when it comes to your political career. One is that in 2008, um, you were elected to the Pennsylvania State Legislature, becoming the first Democrat ever to represent your legislative district. And the second first would be that together with your brother, Kevin, who was also elected to the state legislature two years later, two, two years after you, you are the first brothers to serve together in the state house. And since I'm one out of three girls, um, I think I can probably, I mean, I don't know, but I can probably say that it's not always easy or maybe it might be a, a special honor to serve with your brother. Um, I'd be interested to hear more about that. Um, now you're in your third term and um, you're currently serving on the House Ways and Needs Committee and on the House Committee on the Budget. And Congressman Boyle, I would like to turn it over to you for some short introductory remarks on the state of transatlantic relations and uh, maybe also ask you to comment on the latest developments that David mentioned in the beginning um, for um, just some comments on the recent decision by President Trump to withdraw about 9,500 uh, troops from Germany um, and how that view was seen from your side. Yeah, well, thank you, Elizabeth. It's great to be, to be with you and with uh, FMC, which I, a group that I, I have a great uh, admiration for and always enjoy when I get the opportunity to do something with FMC. I have to say a special uh, hello to my, my former congressional colleague and my fellow Pennsylvanian, Charlie Dent, uh, who uh, someone who was uh, and still is a, a friend from when we served together and, and we still see each other, uh, run into each other quite often. Um, let, me, let me just take a step back for a second because I think I, I want to anchor the latest 
um, development. Uh, first, I come at this, as some of you might know, as a very much committed transatlanticist. Um, I believe that it is in the best interest of Europe and it's in the best interest of the United States. Uh, for roughly uh, 75 years or so, this transatlantic relationship has anchored the entire world and helped spread freedom, democracy, open markets. It's something I, I very much believe in. Now, fortunately, from say, Harry Truman in 1945, a Democrat like Harry Truman, a Republican like Dwight Eisenhower, Democrat like Kennedy, Republican like Nixon, all the way through to Reagan, both Bushes, Clinton and Obama, commitment to the transatlantic relationship here in the United States was a bipartisan issue. You would have some disagreements, I think during the Cold War era, especially post-Vietnam, Republicans might criticize Democrats as not being strong enough on, on defense. But by and large, there was no uh, political home for anyone who would say, um, you know, we should, we should pull out of, of Europe. It, it, those who had it was very fringe, uh, fringe view. Obviously, Donald Trump's election in 2016 changed things and has broken down the sort of bipartisan consensus around the, the transatlantic uh, relationship. We know because of not just the recent book that's come out, but other reports as well as public statements that this president believes uh, NATO is essentially uh, a ripoff to the, to the United States that we are being taken uh, advantage of, advantage of uh, being fleeced. Um, we know because of other reports, his staff had to convince him a couple times not to pull us out of, of NATO. And then of course, that leads us to the latest development of pulling out the just uh, shy of 10,000, or the announcement of pulling out just shy of 10,000 uh, troops from, from Germany. Obviously, I, I oppose that. I, I've been quite pleased to hear a number of my Republican colleagues on Capitol Hill also speak out against that. I would say that even during the Trump era, while I served in the Foreign Affairs Committee, um, you had Democratic and Republican members really, um, with, with only one exception I can think of, uh, singing from the, the same hymnal in terms of the transatlantic relationship and commitment to it. So I, you do have this sort of dichotomy actually on the Republican side between the administration and those who are on the Hill who have more of the, the, uh, the traditional view. And that's where, where things stand right now. Um, final point I, I will just say is, and this is a challenge for those of us who are committed to the transatlantic relationship, believe it is incredibly important. Um, this is not a major issue for American voters. Actually, you can say foreign policy in general is not typically the way that you win you know, most elections in the United States. The period after September 11th was a brief exception to that. If we're engaged in a war like in Vietnam in 1968, but other than those sort of celebrated exceptions, foreign policy generally ranks quite low on, on the list for voters. So I think the challenge for those of us, uh, for me personally, uh, is to show why this is relevant to, to my voters, to my constituents, and why it's important. And I think that's something that we constantly need to do and make sure that this relationship is not allowed to be taken for granted which I, I fear might have been a, a problem in, in recent years. Thank you very much, Congressman Boyle. And thank you very much for reminding us that the strong ties uh, that we have, or of the strong ties that we still have, despite some hiccups or whatever you want to call that. Now, we'll travel across the Atlantic now um, to our next speaker from Berlin, Peter Bayer. Peter Bayer is a member of the German Bundestag from the CDU and has been the coordinator for transatlantic relations in the Bundestag since 2018. He was born in Ratingen in the west of Germany and completed his military service in Wuppertal in the early 1990s. Now I feel like I have to mention your military service despite, uh, given the topic. Um, Peter Bayer studied law at the universities of Düsseldorf and Bonn 
And I have to say that at events in Berlin, Peter Bayer stands out as one of the few German parliamentarians with a beautiful American accent. And when I looked at his bio, I knew immediately why. Um, he not only worked as an attorney at an American law firm for some time, but he also received a master's degree of law from the University of Virginia School of Law. And Peter Bayer has been a member of the German Bundestag since, since 2009 and serves as parliamentary special rapporteur on transatlantic relations in the Committee of Foreign Affairs. Peter Bayer, you are a committed transatlanticist as well. And I wondered what was your first reaction when you heard about the announcement of the withdrawal by Trump? Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Um, and, and thanks for, for pointing out. I, I, today I'm speaking as a member of the parliament, not as the federal government's transatlantic coordinator, but as a parliamentarian, so I might speak a little bit more frankly. So, um, yeah, what was my first reaction? Um, you know, it, it should not have come as such a big surprise, but in the end it was a surprise. Uh, first remark, why did I say so? Why, why do I say so? Because if, if we go a little bit back in time uh, until August of last year, 2019, then U.S. Ambassador Rick Rennell, uh, ambassador to Germany, Rick Rennell, was, you know, it was perceived here a little bit like a threat that there might come a withdrawal of uh, U.S. soldiers from German soil. We did not really, um, well, we, we, we were shocked last year, but we probably did not really take it uh, so seriously. The reason for that was that, that we were convinced and still are that not only are U.S. soldiers and their families very welcome uh, to Germany. We, we want them, we need them, they are friends, they are an integral part of the communities where they live, where, where, where they live. but we also uh, thought and still think that, you know, it's, it's, uh, it could not be in the, uh, in the national security interest of, of, of the United States of America to withdraw troops from you know more or less the center of uh, of of, of, of uh, U.S. footprints on the continent in, in in Europe, because you know although Rammstein, for example, the the, the base here is uh, the largest one outside of the United States of America, um, you know the, the United States they need this hub uh, for many uh, for many operations they are leading from here. Um, UCOM, AFRICOM, and other things. So it's gigantic. It's important for the Americans. And they just recently are invested or in the process of, process of investing uh, nearly to 1 billion euros uh, to a uh, to new hospital infrastructure there. By the way, uh, 150 million euros coming from uh, German taxpayers for that matter. One mustn't forget. So yes, I was surprised um, when I heard this. And I was not only surprised, but a little bit angry because the way it was communicated to us here was through a leaked, as I should say, uh, a Wall Street Journal newspaper article. And this lingered on for, 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 for about a week. We did not hear any official comment statement, was it true or not? And we're, we were not just sitting here and you know, maybe it's true or not. Our, our embassy uh, over in Washington, D.C. was trying to work all the channels of the White House, the National Security Advisor, O'Brien, but, um, you know, there was no, no real answer. So um, that, was not, that was not the way we, we think, uh, you know, should, you should uh, uh, communicate with, with, with a very close friend and ally. So that was a surprise and a little bit of a shock. Um, so, um, uh, I mean, it was, to me, it was clear at one point in time that it was not just a rumor uh, um, because of what was said already last year in August and, and, and September that something is in the pipeline. And we also hear that for some months before this announcement, uh, 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 you know, U US military was working on, <clears throat> on, on preparing that. But you know, then it was also clear after a short while that the announced day, 1st of September, that they would withdraw nine and a half thousand U.S. soldiers this is not possible logistically. You know, um, count it, well, 
nine and a half thousand soldiers, you cannot just uh, uh, withdraw, you know, back to the United States of America, back to, uh, to, to, to replace to some other country, maybe to Poland. We might talk about this later. Um, but you, you, you have to count in also, uh, add on top of the nine and a half thousand, their families of the soldiers, and you come up to roughly about 20,000 persons. Um, that takes quite a while. Um, and also, uh, I mean, you, you probably all have seen this, uh, this letter, uh, bipartisan letter um, by U.S. Congresswomen and Congressmen dated June 9th, addressed to the President of the United States, Donald Trump, saying, well, this is, and I quote, we believe that such steps would significantly damage U.S. national security, as well as strengthen the position of Russia to our, that is U.S.'s detriment. And yesterday, you also uh, probably uh, saw the initiatives by, from the Senate side, also bipartisan, saying, hmm, um, <laughs> this is, uh, you know, it, uh, uh, the, the Secretary of Defense has to, um, has to prove or uh, uh, declare to U.S. Congress um, that it will not be detrimental to the national security interests of the United States of America, not uh, in contrast to the interests of NATO members. Otherwise, um, we will not uh, free the money because um, power of the purse is with Congress. Um, so they, they're trying to slow down things. And I, from, from the network uh, that I have to the Pentagon, um, I would, uh, you know, I, I get the impression that uh, Pentagon is not very enthusiastic about these ideas. But all this, you know, I, I don't know what's going to happen, but uh, I, I will finish with, 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 with a general remark on the status of the transatlantic relations because this is only the latest addition to the troop withdrawal announcement. Um, you know, uh, uh, Congressman Ball quite rightly said that maybe one of the mistakes of the past uh, was that we took transatlantic relations for too long a time for granted. It's been, it's been there, it's been working smoothly. And that is a criticism that I address to myself, to us here in Germany. Uh, and I could talk on for this for, for, for a long time, I won't, uh, because also I'm convinced there's, we don't have the luxury to waste time uh, for only looking back. No, we have to accept um, the changed transatlantic realities, and there is no time for transatlantic nostalgia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter Bayer. And I would like to turn it over to Charlie Dent and maybe yeah. also respond uh, to the point uh, to what extent this move is uh, in the interest of uh, the United States of America and the strategic national interest. Um, but before I turn it over to you, just a few words of introduction as well. Charlie Dent is served as a Republican congressman for Pennsylvania from 2005 to 2018. And in 2018, he joined the law firm DLA Piper, where he provides strategic advice and counsel to clients, both on the federal, state, but also on the local level, on a variety of issues, including but not limited to trade and defense and many other issues. During his time in Congress, he served on the House Committee on Appropriations, where he chaired the Subcommittee on Military Construction, Veteran Affairs and Related Agency. And while in Congress, he also served as the Congressional Study Group of, uh, on Germany's co-chair. It's great to have you with us, Charlie Dent. And yeah, maybe you would like to answer uh, or to respond to some of the points that have been raised and uh, Tell us a bit more about whether you see this latest move in the strategic interest of the United States. Sure. Well, thank you for having me. It's great to be with uh, so many friends and good to be with my friend uh, Brendan Boyle and Peter Beyer and Alexander as well. Uh, but I, I largely agree with what I just heard from both uh, uh, from uh, Brendan and, and Peter uh, on the state of transatlantic uh, relations. The only thing I would uh, probably add is this. The, the letter I think that Peter referred to on June 9th was the letter that was actually sent just by Republican members of the House Armed Services Committee, uh, 22 of them, uh, that made a very strong uh, state, they made a very strong statement uh, in support of maintaining our, our strong, robust uh, military presence 
uh, in Germany for a whole host of reasons, most of which have to do with, uh, uh, you know, obviously keeping a, a, a check on, on uh, Russian uh, uh, aggression uh, and, uh, and opportunism. And also, of course, uh, to help advance America's uh, logistical capabilities, which, uh, which uh, Peter Beyer referred to, uh, that uh, we were uh, AFRICOM and, of course, European Command are both headquartered uh, in, in Germany. Uh, and uh, that's a place from which we project power. Uh, as, a, as a member who uh, served on the Appropriations Committee and who uh, was responsible for military construction projects, I became very familiar with uh, many of the projects in the region, whether it was in Stuttgart or at Rammstein, Landstuhl, uh, K-Town, Kaiserslautern, uh, and, and elsewhere, uh, Bengalum, uh, we have a very robust presence there. And, uh, and, and if there is going to be a repositioning or redistribution of American forces in Europe, in Europe that must be done as part of a, a, a broader conversations with our, our allies and partners in the region. So if we are going to move or redeploy troops from, say, from Germany to Poland, well, let's have that conversation. And we have troops elsewhere. We have them in the United Kingdom, in Italy, in Spain. So we have troops all over Europe. So we can have that conversation. One thing on basing, too, that is not well known in the United States, that it is often less expensive for the United States government to base our troops overseas than at home, uh, in large part because of the contributions we receive, the United States receives, uh, from uh, foreign governments, whether it's in Japan, uh, South Korea, and, and, and I believe Germany as well. Uh, so something to think about. Uh, now, the uh, the the uh, other issue I would I mention on on this uh, potential redeployment of these troops uh, from Germany is that the uh, uh, the House Armed Services Committee I know is dealing with what's called the National Defense Authorization Act, which they deal with each year, and I suspect Congress will weigh in on this issue in in that bill. It seems that there is a strong bipartisan consensus uh, to uh, you know uh, uh, an opposition uh, to the president's uh, uh, declaration, which I should note not only blindsided our friends in Germany, they were completely surprised uh, by the announcement. The way it was, I suspect many people outside of the White House uh, in, in Washington were blindsided too. I, I don't think the Pentagon was given much of a heads up here, uh, which has a, an enormous interest, of course, nor was Congress. So, so many people were, uh, surpri were <clears throat> surprised by this, even though they, they had heard rumblings of this in the past uh, from then Ambassador uh, Grinnell. Um, and others, uh, it's, it's a problem. So I guess uh, one thing I would say too, and, and, and my friend Brendan Boyle is correct in that United States foreign policy is typically not the major issue that drives elections. Uh, and that was in part because for 75 years, there was a bipartisan consensus on, on particularly on the transatlantic relationship. And in fact, many would argue that the transatlantic relationship was the crowning, uh, the crown jewel of American foreign policy since the end of the second world war. Uh, this is the one thing that I thought everyone agreed on, and that the, that Europe was the uh, and NATO uh, were the uh, foundation of American national security policy uh, since the uh, Second World War. So we really never debated it. I mean, there was no reason to because there, was, there seemed to be complete agreement. Whatever our differences may be on burden sharing, or you know maybe you know talking about repurposing or refocusing NATO to other missions, as we did after 9/11 maybe with respect to China. I mean, but, but bottom line is uh, there was a consensus that the shared values and the shared interests is what united us. Uh, and, um, and that seemed to be something that was never going to be questioned, although it has now. And, uh, and I, I just conclude by saying, I think transatlantic relations are in, in a really bad place right now. And it's gonna take a lot of work to reconstruct and rebuild um, some of these uh, relationships uh, once the current administration is gone. Thank you very much, Charlie Dent. And uh, last but not least, I'll turn it back to Berlin and over to Alexander Kulitz, um, who is a member of the FDP of the Liberal Party in the German Bundestag. And as a lawyer, he worked uh, on data protection issues before he entered uh, the Bundestag, and um, in which he did in 2017. Um, and he now serves as a member of the Foreign Affairs Committee in the Parliament. Um, Alexander Kulitz, your hometown, Tübingen, is not very far from Stuttgart. 
Stuttgart, um, and we just talked about Stuttgart and about the US Africa Command. So um, I wonder to what extent has um, the recent decision um, changed your view on the transatlantic relationship? Is it maybe just one addition to many other comments and, and actions that have been taken beforehand? And where do you see the long-term trend when it comes to the transatlantic alliance? Well, thanks a lot, Elizabeth. And um, let me also say a very well, uh, good morning to everybody, because I think in Germany we're way ahead in time than we are in the United States at the moment. It's a great honor to be here. Um, yeah, well, I, actually, I, don't, I was born in Tübingen, but I was raised and I actually live, come from Ulm, from, and I lived in Ulm. But um, in Ulm, we used to have a base very closely in New Ulm, which closed down already quite early in the 1990s. But I, I believe that was my first transatlantic experience because when my grandfather started his business, we actually had a small shop on the base, on the American premises, selling all kinds of souvenirs and stuff to American soldiers. And being a kid, not speaking English at that time, we're talking about the age of five, six, seven years. I always loved going to the American base. Why? Because they had the way better cinema. They had this playground, which was like huge compared to all the playgrounds we had in Ulm. So I really much enjoyed being on the base in these times. And um, I believe that's probably one of the issues that we see nowadays because we lost already a lot of the transatlantic links with all the soldiers who used to serve in Germany, not only in Rammstein and the big uh, locations like Stuttgart, but also in these smaller bases like the one in New Ulm. So looking at the transition period or looking at the time, um, we lost a lot of, I would call them ambassadors, people who know what life was like in, on, uh, uh, in Europe, in serving for a shorter term, probably one or two years in Europe, in Germany. These people going back to the States, definitely they're missing nowadays and vice versa. Us in Germany, we are lacking the experience with Americans being in Germany and serving here, seeing them, feeling them, being like very close to them. Um, and that, that I believe is one of the main reasons why it's getting more and more difficult also to support the transatlantic trends in Europe, in Germany, when you talk to public, when you talk to the people. And there has been uh, several surveys in the past where it uh, seems that uh, definitely uh, Donald Trump being the president of the United States at the moment is more or less catalyzing this, um, um, where it seems that this, um, uh, I wouldn't call it anti-Americanism, but at least the skepticism towards uh, American policy is getting, is get, is, well, it's growing. It's growing drastically, in, especially in Germany. And I believe in favor of the transatlantic relations, we have to counterpart that. We have to do everything that's possible to at least um, get the mutual understanding for each other to get it back into our, um, well, also in our political uh, behavior. Why am I saying this? Because if we look at the news, if we look at the media, if we look at the way that we report in Germany, especially on the White House and on the White House policies, um, there's a huge difference to what is uh, to the perception within the United States. In Germany, it's completely the opposite. It's not that uh, foreign policy plays obviously a huge role also when it comes to election. So it's not that foreign policies is probably like the, the, the uh, it's, it's one of the main, the main topics that we are discussing. And uh, if you look at the media and you look at the way that there is the, re the reporting also on the transatlantic relations takes place, just right now there has been some uh, protocols of the talk from uh, Angela Merkel with, uh, with Donald Trump that might have happened just a few days ago. And you just, if you see those protocols and the way that the media reports about them, it is a little scary because um, it's not really that we talk about issues. We do have differences, definitely. Might it be the pipeline, the Nord Stream 2? Might it be Iran? Might it be that there's, there is definitely, there is some um, things that we have to talk about. What we usually only talk about, the, I would say the a narrative that is more of a, it's more of a soft, it's more of a, we, we kind of talk about the narratives rather than about the foreign policy differences that we have. And um, we should stop that at some point. Otherwise, it will be very, very difficult to, um, to put the puzzle back together or taking Charlie's uh, comment to kind of um, polish the ground jewels a little bit, these ground jewels of foreign affairs that, that some at this point definitely need to be uh, polished a little bit. And we, we, have to, we have to figure out how to do this. And I think the media play a big role also on the German side if we talk about the transatlantic relations. 
Thank you very much, Alexander Kulitz. And um, we have about 15 minutes left. So I would like to invite all of you as the attendees in the audience to um, join the discussion just by using the Q&A function and uh, writing down your question. And I will uh, make sure to include it in our conversation. Um, while I'm waiting for questions from the audience, I would like to turn it back to Congressman Boyle and um, ask you about the next steps um, ahead of us in the next four months, but probably also beyond. Um, it was already mentioned that the announcement um, had the unusual effect, one might say, um, of galvanizing bipartisan um, opposition to, to this recent move. And I would like to ask you, could you outline the next steps um, and the next legislative moves um, to counter this executive move that, move that are ahead of us right now? Yeah, well, so Char um, <clears throat> excuse me, Charlie referenced in his comments the NDAA. That's the National Defense Authorization Act, um, which we are currently doing right now. And between now and the last week of July, that will be done. Um, Charlie referenced, and I, I would agree that I think there is a pretty good chance slipped into the NDAA will be some sort of provision, perhaps as far as going uh, to say that you know, this needs to be paused, any withdrawal of, of troops needs to be reviewed or outright that it can't happen. It'll be interesting to see the way that's maybe massaged. Um, uh, you know, on, on so many issues, there's been a, a bit of an unwillingness on, uh, on the Republican Senate side um, to directly confront President Trump um, as President Trump's domestic poll numbers have dropped, you have, I, I have noticed more of a, more of a willingness to, um, to push back on the administration. So how exactly in the Senate, the Senate leader uh, Mitch McConnell handles that will, will be interesting. I'm optimistic though, that that will be in the, the NDAA. Um, so between now and, and uh, the last week of July, that's when, when that's going to happen. Um, and then in terms of what happens beyond the next four months, it, it all depends upon what happens here in the United States the first Tuesday uh, in November. Um, that will have, as we can all imagine, dramatic ramifications on what the future of this relationship will look like. Thank you very much. Uh, now I have a number of questions coming in and um, I'll turn it over to Alexander Kulitz um, on the question, do you think, do you all think the travel restriction, uh, restrictions in either direction could further hurt the transatlantic relations? I'm quite sure, most definitely, um, because um, I mean, it's quite nice that we have all these digital means nowadays and that we use Zoom like we do at this uh, very conference at the moment. Um, but on the long run, uh, of course, uh, the travel restrictions will certainly harm the transatlantic relations even further. Transatlantic relations are not only a policy thing. It's not only by politicians. The real strength of the transatlantic bond, I believe, lies much more in the societies, in the cooperation that we have on the community level, cooperation in science, in uh, culture, in art, whatever it might be. And if we have these travel restrictions, my sister, she's, she lives in Charlotte. She runs our company there, our family business. And um, at the moment, it's not possible, even though my two nieces, that the, the one is just born like a month ago, we can't see her. The grandmother can't see her. We can't travel. And of course, that um, hurts a lot and that harms a lot, the uh, relation. Bad thing is, looking at our government, that even now our foreign minister still um, postponed the, uh, the, the travel warnings on 160 nations, which is absolutely, it doesn't make sense. There is no epidemic threat at the moment in countries like, uh, let's say, New Zealand. They have no infected at all. So there is no sense in having these uh, restrictions going on, in my opinion. And I believe, especially when it comes to a transatlantic relation, we should very much, uh, uh, United States are big, so we should look at uh, what is happening on the pandemic side in, within the United States. But a travel ban as such doesn't make sense, in my opinion. Thank you. There, I guess there are many obstacles right now um, that are hindering uh, 
fruitful transatlantic um, cooperation right now. Um, one of them is, and that's also been mentioned in, in the question, that um, there is the rumor that President Trump was not um, very happy by uh, Merkel's decision not to join the G7 or G8 summit in June in Washington, D.C. So, Peter Bayer, do you think um, that partly contributed to uh, his recent announcement? And then maybe also commenting on the latest um, developments that probably all of us saw this morning in the news that CNN reported about hundreds of highly classified phone calls with uh, foreign heads of state and government um, and President Trump. And in one of them, I guess, um, President Trump called uh, Angela Merkel stupid. Um, and I, I, I wonder to what extent is it the personal relationship between uh, President Trump and Chancellor Merkel and to what extent is this a long-term trend and are we going likely going to see um, a change after November, depending on the outcome of the results? Mm -hmm. Okay, I started with, with, with the last one with this telephone call. I hear it. Well, the last one was very confrontative. Uh, Chancery is very restrictive about you know, information, giving information about these things what, when they when they happened. Actually, uh, was it three days ago or three weeks ago, which is my last information. So I can't. It, it would be a lot of speculation to comment further on that. I just hear that it's it is something I got confirmed um, from my chance from the Chancery from somebody who was present that it was confrontative. But that's all I can say to that. End. Uh, with regard to the, you know, was, was the president angry or not, 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 not happy with the chancellor's decision not to attend or accept his invitation to come to Camp David uh, to, G, to, to, uh, to attend the G7 summit? I don't know. Maybe, you know, I've, I, I don't think that, it, that this was really the, um, the trigger for the announcements of the withdrawal of the troop. As I said earlier, I mean, it, there was already something publicly uh, put, uh, put on, the, on, on the public table in the public debate by then U.S. Ambassador to Germany, Rick Rennell, that was all this last year, he was all, already mentioning this, that something's coming. Uh, now, now we have this announcement, so th th this was not the real reason. I mean, it might be one element of all this, but I mean, how could anybody expect to travel uh, 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 that an, a, any one heads of state, be it the French president or the German chancellor or somebody else of the G7 club travel to Camp David, to Mar a Lago or so, someplace else, if there's still a, you know, a travel ban on Europeans entering this, this country. So I mean, they cannot do this only because they heads of state to travel. So that was something I, I mean, should have come to nobody's surprise uh, that the chancellor is not coming. So it, it's completely naive and stupid to think, uh, to expect that to happen. I, I want to comment just briefly on the, on the, on the uh, travel ban issue. Um, I think we, it, it's more complicated than Alexander uh, uh, commented on this. You know, you, you have to think, how can you control that? I mean, there's still this travel ban uh, on Europeans, uh, European citizens into the United States of America, uh, which was, I think, issued on... Uh, 17th of March or 16th of March. I remember this so clearly because it was just the day where I wanted to go to Los Angeles, so I had to cancel my, my trip. But um, so, I mean, it's complicated. So think about, you have about 20 US states uh, where there's still hotspot activity regions with a lot of infections, increasing infection scenario. So uh, if, if we would be allowed, for example, to travel to Washington, D.C. or to New York City, so, um, you know, nobody can really, so you are, you are immigrated into the United States of America, you're stamped in your passport from the, by the immigration officer, but, but what then? You can leave the airport, take a train to downtown, or then leave the train to the, ne to the next airport, and you have a connecting domestic flight. I don't think it's practical, so you have to find a solution for that. And so far as I see that it can only be a nationwide solution. So it's complicated. It's not like that the German office, uh, Federal Foreign Office, and now I'm speaking of the transatlantic coordinator of the far federal uh, gov of the government, uh, is, is taking this lightly. I was the first one some weeks ago, um, you know, going public with the state and saying, well, we need to start talks with the Americans um, how, how to get rid of 
you know, uh, uh, reciprocal uh, travel bans and uh, to, to allow to find ways that we are allowed again to uh, travel to each other's countries. So there are 10 talks ongoing. I have a number of questions coming in and we only have five minutes left, um, but I would like to touch upon the topic of North Stream because um, there have been several questions on it. And um, one of the uh, attendees asked, um, I would be interested to hear the members of Congress view on the new proposal for extra sanctions on North Stream 2. Is there a possibility this will again pass through the NDAA? And I would like to turn it over to the, our two members of Congress. Maybe Charlie Dent, yeah, you want to start? Uh, sure, I, I can't speak to what uh, Congress will do in the uh, defense authorization bill that is currently before Congress on Nord Stream 2. Uh, I suspect there could be some action, but in my view, in, in the context of the broader transatlantic relationship, um, that while that is certainly an important issue to those of us on the American side, and I understand the complexity of the history of that issue uh, with respect to Chancellor Schroeder, um, you know, I, I don't think that is an issue that is front of mind right now uh, to most Americans, uh, at least uh, m most members of Congress. And I'll let Brendan ad address that because he's currently in Congress and I'm not. But it seems to me this broader relationship of the troop uh, withdrawal and just the rather at times toxic relationship between the administrator, the president anyway, and many of our friends and partners, I think that is driving um, uh, much of the, uh, uh, of the agenda. And so it's really hard to drill down on specific policy issues like Nord Stream 2 or even China, for example. We all agree that there's a great opportunity for all of us on both sides of the Atlantic to come to some common uh, purpose or mission on how to deal with, uh, you know, uh, Chinese economic transgressions that we all are, are, are suffering under. So right now, I would just say that Nord Stream 2, while important to those of us on the American side, I suspect it's not fun of mind given all the other issues swirling before us. Uh, Brendan, I, what, are, what are your thoughts on that one? Yeah, I, I, I think Charlie got it 100% right. I mean, this is not something that I've heard at all as, as being actively considered and just isn't something that's really being discussed. As Charlie mentioned, it's the other aspects of the transatlantic relationship that, uh, that are coming up especially, you know, in the last 24 hours, the more salacious uh, details about the, the president's um, conversations with Chancellor Merkel, as well as former British Prime Minister Theresa May. Um, by the way, the, the chancellor, I believe, has a PhD in chemistry. Um, so I, I'm certainly not one that's ever going to be stupid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> having, having a PhD in physics, yeah, is for probably physics, a sign physics. for not for not being stupid. Yeah. Um, to conclude this discussion and to end on a positive note, I would like to ask the four of you maybe to name one or two issues where you can see um, a positive um, development with regards to the transatlantic relationships. What could be issues, topics, countries um, that could unite unite Europe and the United States? I will start with Alexander Kulitz and then turn it over to the others. Thank you, I just had to turn on the mic. Um, well, it's a good, it's a difficult question because... Um, <laughs> you have 30 seconds. <laughs> on it, of course, um, no, I think it's, it's as simple as that. As human beings on both sides of the Atlantic, we just have to find a common, uh, we have to take our common values to discuss on them and, and, and try to, to find a personal level rather than only taking the political, uh, the political uh, issues as, as a negotiation topic. That's my, that's my opinion. Charlie Dent, what's your two cents on that? Yeah, I, I think there's plenty of opportunities for cooperation between the US and Europe right now. Um, particularly, I would say China is one issue where you know, I know there's some initial discussions between uh, the U.S. and the EU uh, to talk about a, a, a common uh, purpose to deal with China at the WTO. That, that is long overdue and it's been complicated by our U.S. administration's, uh, you know, uh, uh, trade wars with uh, friendly countries like Canada and Mexico and Brazil and our European friends and German cars. Uh, so that's complicated it, but that's an issue uh, uh, on China. Uh, I would also... Uh, suggest that maybe even on trade just between the US and the EU. Well, we don't have a TTIP any longer. 
uh, maybe we can come up with something perhaps a bit more narrowly focused. So those are just two issues I would throw out there right now. Where we could, uh, you know, try to recalibrate, if not in this administration, then certainly in the next one. Thank you very much. Peter Bayer, what do you think? All of the above, and that, but I would also mention uh, one thing. One of the lessons learned already from the pandemic is a closer cooperation in sciences, uh, not only in sciences with regard to searching for a vaccine, but beyond that. And there are already many, many good examples that were starting and launched pre-pandemic, pre-corona, but which we are intensified now, not, not just uh, focus on like search for vaccine or medical or health issues, but really beyond. And that is some, one of the lessons that, that should be learned that I think it, are already learned to uh, intensify the cooperation in that field uh, for, 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 the, for the future. So that is a very positive agenda. Thank you. And finally, Congressman Boyle. Yeah, I, Charlie uh, took the answer right out of my mouth. No question, China. I was in, I had the opportunity to be in uh, Hamburg, Germany a few years ago for the G7 summit. And I was amazed the way President Xi was being uh, welcomed as if he were somehow a leader of an open and Western society. The events of COVID-19, I think, are a... Um, a stark reminder that the Chinese government is different than all of our governments. Whatever you know, differences uh, at, at different times we, we might have with one another. Uh, and I think for the United States and for European countries to work together, not in a saber rattling way, but in a, a more realistic way about China, I think is uh, long overdue. Well, I guess that it seems that um, the Atlantic is not only widening, or at least it's not widening for everyone. Um, thank you so much to all of you. Um, thank you to our speakers for sharing your view from Washington, but also from Berlin. And thank you to our colleagues from M FMC's Congressional Study Group on Germany, but also to our friends from Atlantic Brücke for hosting this. And thank you to all of you, to the participants for listening and for actively, actively participating. I'm sorry I couldn't take all the questions, but uh, hopefully we'll have more time next time. Stay safe Thank and you. bye.